Backyard Composting 101. I wanted to just try and cover some of the most basic aspects of composting because I feel like it's such a simple concept, but there's so many different ways to do it and people are like, oh, this is the right way or, you know, oh, that's not the way to do it. But um, what I really wanted to get across to people is that there's a million ways to do it and it does not have to look the same as your neighbor. Um, and talk a little bit about the basics of carbon to nitrogen ratios because that can be kind of confusing for people. So um, we'll also do a bit of a rundown on uh, some of the most basic like umbrella methods uh, that people can use and you can hopefully take away from this um, what kind of composting method might work best for your setting. Um, I just wanted to kind of take a moment to consider composting um, as just just in general as such an asset to our community because we're kind of in this we're definitely in this huge issue with recycling in the valley right now where plastic's been pretty much put on hold and we've only got like some basic options are um, <coughs> the local glass recycling company just went out of business they just sold everything and that was such a great resource for us as like a valley with so little options um, so composting is probably the most efficient kind of recycling that we can do in this valley because we're so separated from, like if we want to recycle glass or any other kind of material, we have to truck it to Spokane or wherever. And this form of recycling, you can take it into your own hands, you can do it at your house and that's as local as it gets. So, and it also provides us with a resource that's incredibly valuable to the local soils here. It's not just like, it's, it's important to crush, crush glass or recycle whatever material. Um, and we get something that's useful out of it. But with composting, you get something that's like, not just useful, it's invaluable. And it's something that you can use in your garden, you can give it to your friend, it's, it's something that everybody can use somewhere. <laughs> so who am I <laughs> and why am I talking to you about this? Uh, I started Dirt Ridge Compost in July, four years ago now. So um, we are, I guess you'd consider us like a large scale composting operation. We're not in municipality size, but we're medium. Um, we are contracted out by all of Glacier National Park, <coughs> um, different restaurants all around the valley and for by residents too. So people who are, you know, uh, producing up to, oh, Glacier National Park is sometimes a 1500 gallon day that we are composting that much food waste in one day. So it's a lot of waste. Um, we are located in Columbia Falls. Yeah, I've been doing this for four years. I'm an ag background, but I ended up being more interested in the soil cycles and um, recycling in general and making sure that we uh, take care of our soil or we're not gonna grow good food. I'm sure there's like a vast uh, variation of people's understanding of compost and how much experience they have with it. Um, who has done their own compost before in the backyard? Who, who is like <coughs> aspiring to do that and is wanting to do it this year? Okay, so it's like a good mix of people who have some, maybe some basic understanding and some folks that maybe could use a little brush up too. So um, I'm sure anybody who's looked online or in a book about um, composting the same, oh, you gotta get the carbon to nitrogen ratios right. Um, so what is, the material that have more nitrogen and more carbon and this might be like an overview for people so sorry if it is already but um i think of anything that's nitrogenous is having color so um you can see there's some salmon up there uh anything that's kind of still alive has, and it has color is nitrogenous there's some grass there there's some poop um there's some garden cutback some kale from the garden that's not fully like dead yet. So that is nitrogen. That's gonna be the part of your pile that's causing the heat if you decide to do um, a method that's gonna be involving. And carbon is anything that's dead and gone. It's brown. Um, so that's gonna add kind of the, the biggest bulk to your compost. Um, and it it is an important factor that people either don't have enough of, and if they don't have enough of it, too much nitrogen, that pile is going to smell, or it's not going to do anything. It's just going to become putrid. It's going to become an animal attractant. And if you have too much carbon, it's not going to do much. So it's not going to be heating up, right? <clears throat> so you can see there's like wood chips, brown paper bags, 
leaves. Like, these are all things that we all have, and we probably, most of it, end up getting thrown away. Um, or some of it end up getting thrown away, where we could be utilizing it as our carbon source. So the different composting methods we're going to talk about are thermal composting. That's the composting method that involves heat. Um, static or cold composting uh, and vermicomposting with worms. All right, so I kind of made a little rubric of things to consider, characteristics of static composting, thermal composting, and vermicomposting that you might want to consider when you're trying to decide which method to use for your household setting. Um, so if we're starting with Static composting, you can see some different examples up here. It's, it's very high carbon. Um, it's great for farms or for people that have a lot of backyard cutback, like some um, grass clippings, but also like a lot of leaves and um, pine needles that have fallen on the ground and they end up bagging it up and putting it in the landfill, which makes zero sense because it's a great resource to turn into back into a soil um, amendment. So. It's kind of known as the compost happens method. So um, oftentimes it just, you pile it up um, and you let it sit. So the materials that you need for a static composting pile is anything, mostly carbon materials, um, straw, wood chips, food waste, and small quantities, which is considered um, the nitrogen portion. So it's gotta be in pretty small quantities. That's not. That's not the main thing that you want to be composting if you're doing the static method. You can compost food waste with it, but because food waste is the nitrogen source, it's going to be heating that pile up and you want to keep it cool. You don't want to have to deal with it. So um, brown bags, egg cartons, you're going to need some water. Um, limbs, yeah. So yeah, um, you can layer limbs in there. Those are going to take the longest to break down, but um, lots of people need to process limbs and they don't know what to do with them. That's a great way to do it. Um, so materials, yeah. Carbon and nitrogen ratio. So you'd probably in that setting not want to have more than 10% nitrogen. And um, let me just take a second. I'm veering back. So you can look up online like, ooh, wood chips have whatever percent um, carbon to nitrogen ratio and leaves have this and food waste has this and it's like, you can, you can get a basic understanding of the ratios or the percentages <coughs> online. You can, you can figure it out. But I just, I really suggest because it varies and that's not the best resource to know specifically for your, what you have, depending on how old it is, how dry it is, all these different things. Like you can't really say how much carbon <coughs> percent is in a wood chip unless you know that exact wood chip and how much water, blah, blah, blah. So just experiment. You know, get a basic understanding idea from that idea of brown to greens and, uh, and experiment on your own. Don't like feel like you have to get it perfect. Mess it up as much as you want. It's okay to mess it up and try again. But um, so carbon and nit nitrogen ratios with the static cold composting, 10% um, nitrogen or less. Uh, pathogens. So another thing that we need to consider when we're composting is like, um, are you putting human or animal feces in it? Are you putting food waste in it? Is there something that might, if you put that compost on your garden later, get you sick? Um, this method is not a great method to break down human pathogens because generally you need heat. The cold composting method is not gonna give you that. So if you're wanting to compost uh, feces, not the best method, right? Um, the amount of material that you would use for static composting, um, it can be as little of a pile as you want or it can be huge. That's why it's great for farms because they can just pile a ton of stuff up and leave it. Um, and it can be as big as they want. So the next thing to consider with static is the space. So how much space will you need for it? Um, also depending on the size. Uh, generally, somebody that's doing static cold composting, I'd be like, you need a pretty big backyard probably, at least some backyard area. <laughs> but the great thing about static composting, especially in this area, because wildlife is such a huge issue when we're composting, um, that you don't have to worry about it being an animal attractant. Your, your backyard does not need to be fenced. 
So, because there's no food to attract the animal. So that's something to consider in your situation. Um, leads. Do you have a ton of, like, invasive weeds that you want to get rid of? Um, or, you know, weeds from your garden that you just pulled? Do not throw it in this pile uh, because of the same heat issue. It's, it's going to be spreading those weed seeds in places that you don't want to. Because so, it doesn't get hot enough. Because to kill it them. does not get hot enough to kill them. So this is not a good method if you want to compost weeds. Um, personal input. So that's another thing to consider. I tell people like, how much time do you want to put in your compost? Uh, because you could spend every day with that compost pile, and some people do, and that's just because they're compost nerds and they like it, like myself. Um, but some people don't want to do that. They're busy. They have other jobs. They have kids. Um, so you need to consider that too when um, you're trying to decide what kind of composting to look into and do. Uh, this is the least input on your behalf. Like, you pretty much just throw it there and let it process, right? Yeah. Does a big static pile compost faster than a small static pile, or is it? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, faster? No. Yeah. No, no, if so you have a big old pile. Size doesn't matter on the. Say that again? Size doesn't size matter does on the matter. rate of compost. Size does matter, yes. So if you've got a huge pile, um, there's going to be some finished stuff underneath, but it's going to take a lot of time to break that down. That's the next thing that I'm getting to is time till it's finished. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do with that compost? Do you want to have it consistently throughout the year? Or is it like, I just want to do something with this material and recycle it? Like, is the actual product a concern for you or not? Because if you're piling something up like that in the static method, you're not putting as much energy into it, but it's going to take a lot more time to give you what you want. So um, that pile up there is going to be like at least like about two years probably. So you just let it sit. Um, the product <coughs> record from Static composting is fantastic product. Um, so I'm sure if any of you guys have gone to any other classes talking about soil biology um, at Free the Seeds, you may have heard uh, about you know fungi and bacteria and microbes in the soil and how important they are. In garden soils that have been tilled or just um, farmed at all, generally it's really, really high in bacteria and really, really low in fungi, and that's a problem. That causes weeds. That causes low nutrient density in your plant. So this compost is like gold because generally it's it's totally fungi dominant. So you're adding fungi back into your um, into your garden soil, which is really important. And is this better, a better method than the other ones for getting that, or? You know, um, I'm going to go ahead and say that you can't, it, it, a lot of people say, no, it's not. If you know what you're doing and you're doing thermocomposting well or vermicomposting well, then you can get a great fungal content out of those methods. I'm going to go ahead and say that this is the easiest way that you can mess up to get a good dominant, like fungi dominant material. You don't. Because fungi don't like to be uh, messed with. They don't like a lot of activity. And what you're doing is you're letting that sit. You're not touching it. And oftentimes, it's even great to put like a tarp over it or something like that. Make sure you're keeping it moist. But that's where fungi love to grow. And you don't have to do anything about it. Nature takes its course. So yeah. Did you have Oh, well, I, I don't know if this is related or not, but I've been reading up on something called Google Culture Beds, uh -huh. where you kind of bury sticks and woods, and it sounds kind of like this static method that you do, but then you top it with some comp, you know, compost and soil, and then just kind of let that compost over time. So mm -hmm. you kind of plant it <coughs> on top of your compost pile. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't know a ton about Google culture, I've used it a little bit, um, but I have, I'm sure that there's a fungal, like, it encourages some fungal growth, I imagine, but I've also just read that it's also, the um, benefits are that it keeps water, sorry, water retention is the main priority with Google culture, but I am by no means like, Google culture person. But yeah, I'm sure that would be a thing. Yeah. 
you mentioned obviously not putting uh, weeds or anything noxious in these piles. Right. If you have a weed issue, what are we supposed to do with that? Burn it? I mean, what? Where do you, do you put it in a pile in a corner in the middle of your, you know, the side of your yard that you're not growing things? What do you do with it? So. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Thermal composting is a great method in that scenario because um, it is heating up. Uh, what we use at our site is thermal composting and our piles are getting up to about 160 degrees for weeks at a time sometimes. So that's definitely killing human pathogens. That's definitely killing weed seeds. Do you have to stack it in a certain order? Generally, um, I'd say the best practice for any kind of composting is to just a basic layering method. Like, try to like put a little bit in, of intention. Like it doesn't, with all of this stuff, like just just try it. But generally like layering is a good way to go, especially if you're adding in this situation, if you are adding nitrogen, like with grass clippings or food waste, you wanna make sure that you're not just throwing the nitrogen into one clumped area because that will end up possibly putrefying if it's too much. But yeah, just like distribute it and layer it a little bit. It's a really great method for people who have a lot of garden cut back, a lot of um, branches and trees and grass clippings and you know just stuff from a big backyard that they're like, what do I do with this? I don't want to pay a bunch of money to go throw it in the landfill where it's not even being used. So pile it all together, leave it for two years, and <coughs> you will have gold. So the materials that you're gonna want for thermal, um, all of the same materials as you would for static, but uh, this is where people talk about it being important to make sure that you get the right nitrogen to carbon ratios um, and how I spoke about if you have too much nitrogen it's just gonna smell like crap and it's not gonna do much besides attract flies if you have too much carbon it's not gonna do anything and it's gonna act like a static pile it's gonna take two years to break down um, so carbon and nitrogen ratio uh, you're gonna want about 30%, some people might call this high, about 30% nitrogenous material, so food waste or grass clippings or cover crop that you just cut, whatever. Um, and the rest, carbon material. I have a quick question about that. Is that 30% yep. like by volume or by weight? Or how do you like? Um, I just look at it, that's a great question. I, I will be honest, like when I do any of this stuff, I'm like more, I will use my hands and just like a basic intuition when I look at things. And that's the whole idea behind like trying it. Is this like in troubleshooting? Like are you, what issues are coming up? Oh, I must have too much carbon right now. Um, because you could get really scientific about it, but it, I would I would say it's unnecessary. So just try it. Just try and add what you look. If you're eyeballing something, be like, okay, well this material looks like about thirty percent of this. Sorry, I can't be more specific. <laughs> and if you have come with a system that's much more like articulate, like and detailed, let me know. Um, yeah. So human pathogens. If you're wanting to, and people all over the world do this freaks people out, but if you want to compost poop, this is a great method for that. Like whether it's dog poop, human poop, whatever, um, that carries pathogens, human pathogens or food waste. We used to pick up from Kalispell Regional Medical Center. Who knows, right? So we want to make sure that that's getting really hot and that we're turning it a certain amount of times and we're regulating it to make sure that there's no human pathogen issues. And we do tests afterwards too. Um, and that's an option to keep in mind as well. If you're not sure after your compost is finished, you could get it tested. Um, yeah, so this is a great method if you want to compost food waste or poop. <laughs> uh, so the amount of materials that you will need. Um, you can process as much material as you have space for, um, pretty much. So this is gonna have to be outside in general. I'm sure people have ex like experimented with doing it inside. Go for it. I am not gonna put that in my house personally. I'm probably gonna try and do it outside. Um, so the space that you can use. Um, you need backyard space. And in this kind of scenario, if you're composting a lot of food waste, we live in Montana and I've had some interactions with the bear specialists here because we compost on such a large level that they kind of need to make sure the tagged bears that they have aren't 
just veering off towards our site because, you know, that's a huge issue. Um, and we've talked with the bear specialists in the valley, and they're like, that's one of the biggest issues that we have with the interface between humans and bears and whatever kind of wildlife is they're not composting correctly, and it's becoming an attractant to these bears and to the raccoons and to whatever else. Um, but if you do it correctly, it's not going to be an issue. But so often we're humans and we forget about it and we, whatever, you know, we're not perfect at it yet. Uh, so it does become an attractant. So that's something to consider if you're going to be composting food waste outside, you need to make sure you're either like super confident about it or it's fenced in. Or you're in an urban setting where you're not afraid that there's going to be bears and raccoons and whatever else getting into it. Yeah. Um, weeds. So this is what you were talking about with the um, invasive weeds or non-natives and weeds from your garden. This is a great method to just add in. And actually, a lot of times, those weeds have some really great um, micronutrients and a, a lot of great things that could be utilized in compost. It's just they're considered weeds here. Um, but actually, they're <laughs> they're serving a purpose and they're actually like mining down really deep in the soil and bringing some things up that could be really useful for your compost. Um, and it's getting hot enough that the seeds shouldn't be an issue if you're getting it up to 130 to 160 degrees for a certain amount of time. Um, so, and that leads me to talk about the personal energy input. So this is going to be the most energy intensive one. Um, yeah, it's going to be the most energy intensive one, and you're going to need to be regulating it to make sure you're doing it correctly. You're going to need to be monitoring the, monitoring the temperature, turning it. Um, so if you're excited and really want to get into composting, really want to make sure that you're composting food and doing all of that stuff, um, and you feel totally fine with dedicating half an hour every day to it or more, depending on if you're turning it that day or not, this is a great method for you. Um, time till it's done. This is also something to consider for the people in here that are more interested in the product that you're getting afterwards and having it more consistently throughout the summer um, or the fall or the spring, whatever. You can get compost. If you're doing thermal composting method properly, you can get compost in like six weeks. Um, so that's something to consider too. You can get more of it, especially if you've got batches going. Um, the product rendered. Uh, thermal compost is awesome. Um, it's got different microbes and different little biota, some that are the same and some that are different from the static composting that are a great addition to any garden soil. So, uh, equipment. So this is going to be a little bit more like of an investment because you got to get a thermometer. I'm sure most people that are gardening have like a pitchfork or a spade shovel hauling equipment and you want to make sure that you feel like you know, strong enough and able enough to be turning, like, depending on how big your pile is, like, five times, you know, transferring it. I'm going to ask you, like, what do you consider turning? Okay, so, um, move the whole pile from one spot to another spot? Right, so if you look at that top picture right there where it's got the boards and everything, like, in my opinion, that's probably the simplest way to go if you're going to do thermal composting is you have, like, three sections of things going on um, or more. And say you get to the top of that pile, you're finished layering, and it's time to start the whole process of turning. You pretty much, yeah, you go, you start from the top and you relayer it over and over. And then you just keep transferring it over. And you just try and mix it up and add water in as you go. So the whole, I'll try and like answer these kinds of questions and I wish I could answer more of them, but um, Primarily, I'm just trying to help you decide, because there's so many different kinds, which ones to start looking into for yourself. Um, yeah, but generally, in that kind of a scenario, you just want to unpack it, relayer it. Yeah. But are you keeping it in the same box, or are you moving it? To um, moving it. To a different box. Yes. Okay. So, like, if I was doing it, it would be, like, my pile's here, and it would end up over here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's every day? Um, so generally with thermal composting, once everything's mixed up and you've got your water going um, in the pile, it's for the first like week you're going to be turning. Like at the beginning you're going to be turning more. And as it, as it ages along you're going to have to turn it less. So ideally you don't want to have to turn it 
more than like five times because that's a lot of energy and that means you probably have too much nitrogen in there. It depends on the space that you have and like how willing you are to get into it. Like in our scenario, because I have a facility, right. we just take it to the <laughs> to our pit. Right. But if I didn't, I would probably be bagging up my food waste, this is me, leaving it outside the door okay. and letting it freeze. That's what we do at Dirt Rich because we don't have large enough equipment yet to be processing at a mass, like a much more mass scale. We've got tractors, we've got turners, but our piles aren't big enough to retain the heat. So we just freeze the food. We, comp, we pile it up, freeze it, and in the springtime, in three weeks, we will be like crazy processing, processing all of it, yeah. Is there any issue with it rotting? Like, rotting without any ground material before, or does that not matter? It can be if some, it's it frozen, can be a no, if you well, don't take, take it outside. outside. For a week, if, you, if, if you're building up in the house for a week. And, and then taking it out, Oh no. and it starts to turn gross, like, there's no, and it's molded and, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's just doing its thing. It's starting to break down a little bit. Yeah, no, it's it no, it's not a problem. Yeah. Uh I have heard of people storing it in their freezer too. Like yeah, people do that. Like a deep freezer, they just fill it up all winter as the meat goes out and mm -hmm. things go in. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, that's actually not a bad method. And you don't have to worry about it heating up outside like on a warmish mm -hmm. day. Totally, and maybe the neighbor's dog yeah. wandering by or something like that. Um, or your dog. Or, or my dog, <laughs> yes. So actually that's another thing that I forgot to talk about with the static piles and why I don't do static piles in my house, because I have a doggy. And he likes to, he loves that pile. He wants to go take crap in it. And then I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, because who knows what I would be spreading in my garden. So consider that if you've got cats and dogs that if, they have access to it, they are going to utilize it. Um, so, and then this is another part to your question too, um, about what to do in the winter. Thermocomposting, I am, I'm a big fan of it. Um, I think it's a great option for people that have limited space. Um, and you could do it inside. So thermocomposting, uh, the materials that you're gonna need. So all the same kind of nitri nitrogen and carbon materials, but uh, more, much more carbon than nitrogen as well. So more like 20% nitrogen and 80% carbon. Um, a worm, I think it's, excuse me, two pounds of worms uh, specific worms that you want to get. You want to get um, red wigglers. You don't want native worms because they're just going to flee. Red wigglers are from Europe and for some reason the worms that they are they will stay put and that's why people use them for vermicomposting. Two pounds of worms will eat a pound of food waste in 24 hours. So half their body weight in 24 hours. It's like they, they're magic little guys. They're pretty awesome. Um, and what <laughs> one of my teachers likes to say what comes out of a worm's butt is magic. <laughs> so it, it's really great product. Um, yeah. So just making sure that you're not feeding them too much food waste, but um, it's pretty easy to tell if you are because they're just, they're fleeing, it smells a little weird, and in that case, all you gotta do is add a little more carbon. They like carbon, you know? Give them some egg, egg cartons and some newspaper and they'll be happy. Um, so the space that you need for varma composting, it's, uh, it's good for indoor composting if you don't have a lot of yard space to utilize or it's unprotected from wildlife and you wanna compost food waste. Uh, it's usually contained in some kind of box, like I made mine out of you know, a storage container and just punched some holes in it. Like it's, it's really easy to make the, the composting setup or like there's a million ways to do it online. There's so many different tutorials of how to make a warm box or whatever. And I have a basement, so I can put it in my basement, but you'd have to get kind of um, creative with where you would put yours, I guess. So, uh, weeds. Do they need to stay warmish, or like would a, like an insulated garage, you know what I mean? Something that's not freezing, but not as warm as a towel? Um, short answer, when it's in a smaller, <coughs> area if you're only like composting this much yes you want to make sure it's above freezing um, if it freezes solid they will die 
Uh, they probably will have some little eggies in there that'll hatch when it uh, defrosts in the spring, but generally they like it to be at least like 40 or 50 degrees. They're, they're more productive at that time like any other, yeah. Um, so weed seeds, issue, don't, they're not gonna be a good uh, tactic for getting weed seeds processed because generally it's not gonna be heating up. You don't wanna, if our piles are heating up, that's when the native worms run. They don't want to be near the heat, they want it to be cool. So not good for processing weed seeds. Uh, personal input time, uh, it's just taking care of the worms, monitoring that there's enough water, not too much. So it's a basic amount, but it's nothing crazy. You can leave them and they'll be okay for a little while. Um, how much water do they need? I mean, it, it depends on how much you have, in your, like how much material you have in your system, but you don't want there to be like a, like a little like lake on the bottom of your thing, but the, the carbon material that you put in there, it's even a best practice to just kind of soak that carbon material. So <coughs> it's, it's wet, but it's not like, if it starts to smell in there, you know that either there's too much water or there's too much nitrogen. Um, I wish I could give you a better answer, but it just depends on how much you have in there, um, how much product. Time till it's done. Um, so it's kind of in between static composting and thermal composting. You can have um, worm compost in like three months, maybe. You know, whereas static's like a year or more and thermal composting can be as little as six weeks. So it's a great in between. Um, and it's just like thermal composting in that you can have different batches set up. So like you can have something consistently being finished within a month. Um, right. would you, you would start a whole bin with stuff. Mm -hmm. And then add your worms to it, and then you start another like. Yes. So um, this is a great one for over. Add to it. Yes. Add your kitchen scraps each night to it, or mm -hmm. you can. You can. Yep. Um, and it's going to get to the point where that's full. That box is full, um, and you want to just let the worms process everything that's in there. And there's a million different systems online. Some are tiered, and then you like attract the worms down from you know your full bin to the one below it that's empty and then they'll come through like the little holes and then they'll go into the, yeah. There's a lot of different methods you can use, but yeah. Where do you get your worms from <coughs> locally? Do you order them? Um, we're actually getting a burma compost operation like set up at our site and we ordered them online. I have people asking me all the time if we have a local source and there's one man that's a friend of mine that farms on a small scale for his family and he's got some worms because he does a lot of burma composting and I can definitely, um, send you his way but like he's got a small small thing going on it's generally online unfortunately right now yeah uh time to done product rendered uh magic <laughs> micronutrient dense uh worm compost it's awesome um and you need less of it than you would like generally if you're buying a thermal compost from our operation or something you it's 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 a soil amendment Right, so you don't need as much, you just need a dusting on whatever soil surface that you're growing instead of like an inch for maintenance of compost. Uh, do -do. When you harvest, how do you, like you were saying, like some of the systems pull the eggs down, but how do you get the compost without all the worms? Like, can yes. you reuse the worms? Yeah, oh yeah, so um, they'll reproduce. That's the other great thing about worms is they're just gonna keep multiplying and you're gonna have so much at some point that your neighbor is gonna be like, I want some, and you can give some to your neighbor um, or expand your operation or whatever you wanna do. But um, the way that you separate the worms from the material is you, uh, you stop feeding them for a while and they've processed everything that's in the box, and then you feed them in one certain area and they will all flock mm -hmm. to that area. And then you can pick out some worms. <laughs> um, so when you said that about newspaper and I'm, what I'm just thinking is, what do you not want to feed them? Or is right. there, are there topics Thank there, is the ink on the newspaper bad for them? Right, that's another, like that's the same idea as like a, a million different people are gonna say a million different things and be more purist than others. And generally I would say that newspaper is fine. Um, because now, aren't they like mostly plant-based inks so now? So yeah. so yeah. inks? And see, some people might be like, I don't really want that in my compost. So it's really just up to you. Um, but yeah, and some people, I use uh, cardboard. Who doesn't have a bunch of cardboard? Um, but people are like, but what about the glues? And I'm like, maybe. 
I don't know. So that's just, I guess, not a great answer. It's a general answer of like, you gotta decide what you're, yeah. Um, Cyril, carbon to nitrogen ratio, less, about 80% carbon or 20% nitrogen. Human pathogens, they're kind of cool in the way that it does not heat up very much. It shouldn't heat up in the, in the box where they're at, but as material passes through their gut, it is um, processing and killing any human pathogen issues. And actually, um, material that's on their skin also can um, deal with human pathogens. So it's less of like a sure process because who knows if the worm has touched every single particle of that material, that could be a human pathogen issue. But generally, most of the people I talk to and from my experience, uh, n no poop, you don't want poop in there because the worms don't like poop, but food waste that could contain human pathogens should be fine in that setting. Um, but the, uh, as far as appropriate materials, uh, this is one drawback of the Burma compost option, is that thermal composting, you can compost meat. Yes, that's right, you can compost meat, you can compost dairy, you can compost all of these things that people have said you can't. Yes, you can do that with thermal composting, um, if you do it correctly. But um, with the worms, they don't like citrus, they don't like meat, they don't like dairy, so it's gonna make them sad. And they will not want to process that material. So if you're a person that wants to process a ton of meat, or uh, all of the things that I just mentioned, this is not gonna be a great option for you. You're gonna have to make sure that it's all um, plant material, really, so, and carbon. Uh, yeah. So Alyssa, would you say that this, the vermicomposting would be the best for us in our area over the winter? Yes, that's what I was gonna, thank you for reminding me to connect that to, is like because we live somewhere so cold, that's, that's a great option. If you have space inside and you wanna like experiment with different box options and just get your system down indoors, it's great. It's so good. Being efficient with your system and making sure that we, and you guys might be like super on this and already know all about this, but I feel like a lot of people don't realize the different home materials that they just throw away that's actually a great resource. Like, where do I get my carbon? It's like, well, if you've got a backyard, there's probably leaves. Maybe. Um, do you guys have, are you guys cutting up wood for the fire? Like you've got some wood chips, maybe that are left over, some bark. Uh, just making sure that we use what we already have. It can be cheap, it can be an easy process, and you can use things that are like right in your house. So instead of going out and buying a bunch of stuff. If you're using newspaper and egg crates, you, are you having to tear that up or you just throw it in there? Um, for vermicomposting? For static. Static? You can tear them up, but no. Nah. I mean, just put them in there, let them break down. Those will probably be some of the faster things that break down, <coughs> even without tearing them up. It's gonna be like uh, woody materials that take a lot longer, like branches, <coughs> yeah. No. But in a worm <coughs> compost setting, you, you wanna tear them up for them a little bit. Yeah, so that's pretty much the majority of what I wanted to cover and just kind of list some other resources that I think are great resources if people haven't already heard about Aling Ingham and the Soil Food Web. Folks, I'm just a huge fan, she's my teacher. Um, and the Complete Compost Gardening Guide, nutrient, teaming with nutrients, teaming with fungi, teaming with microbes. Those are great starting points for understanding the biological processes in the soil and your compost and why it all matters. I wish I could cover it all today, but I can't. Um, and Nicole Masters in Integrity Soils is a great teacher too. She's out of New Zealand. And check out our website at dirtrichcompost.com. Follow us on Instagram. Sometimes we'll like drop little tidbits about different kinds of composting methods. Any other questions? On yeah. Your, on your thermal, where would you locate that? Would it need to be full sun or a shaded area? Does it matter? Um, for any of these composting methods, generally, you don't want it to be in full sun. Um, and mainly because it's going to be drying those piles out. And it's really important that you keep a certain um, amount of moisture in there. Generally, like the ideal amount of moisture is if you grab that material and you squeeze it really, really hard, you want one drop of water to fall out. Yeah. What was the temperature for the, the one at 160, did you say? 
Yeah, and I mean, it depends on how big your pile is because our piles are about yay high and, you know, they're actually windrows. So if it's a bigger pile, it's going to be easier for it to hold on to heat. If it's a smaller pile, like, you know, this, this size, you're going to want it to get to about 100, the 130 is the rule of thumb. 130 for like three days. Yeah. How long should it take to get to 130 if you're doing it right? Right. If you're doing it right, it should get there within two or three days. Yeah. At the most. Yeah. When people talk about composting tea, mm -hmm. well, is that from thermal? Like, is that, <coughs> what is that? <laughs> right. Um, that's a great question. And it's a really, really great material to be using if you know how to do it correctly. Um, aerated compost tea is you're taking a really high quality compost material. It doesn't have to be thermal compost. Actually, a great, any of them. You can use any of them and you'll get something good out of it if you're doing it correctly. Because if you process it for too long, it could create pathogens. And my teacher, Nicole, prefers that people do non-aerated, long story, yeah, do non-aerated and like, say you have your compost, and you dip it in like a bucket of water for, I don't know, a day or something. That's kind of the method that she might use versus compost teas. Because compost teas, if they're made well, are amazing. But the problem that my teachers have found is that people do it incorrectly too often and it either hurts their garden or it just doesn't do much for them. Um, but I've got like a little five gallon you can get them online, like a five gallon bucket that's for aerated compost teas. Generally, if you put like a little, you know, satchel of compost in there, uh, what it has on the bottom of the bucket is like a motor that creates bubbles and it makes sure that that material stays aerated because it becomes a problem if um, it's, the material becomes anaerobic and it can create things that you don't want in your garden. Um, so then what do people do wrong? Do they Leave it there? They leave it for too long. They have, um, it's not becoming aerated enough. Uh, things start to go anaerobic and I, I actually use a, a microscope pretty frequently at my operation and you can see it starts to grow things you that are actually pathogens that you actually don't want to ingest. So compost tea is like a whole other class, like <laughs> six classes, seven classes. But I think it's really great that you asked that question because people need to be thinking about compost teas um, because it's a great way to spread the greatness and like all the juice and nutrients of compost over large areas of ranches, ranch land. Or if you don't have a ton of compost, you're like bummed, like, oh, I only have this much compost that came from my pile. Great, we'll spread it with compost tea. Make some compost tea and spread it over everything, even though you have a little bit. Yeah. So it goes, it goes a longer ways. Yeah. Uh, do it in Montana. Is, is pit composting useful here? Back um, where we were, it was really wet and never really froze that much, so. Yeah. Really I have never utilized pit composting. I know people that do, and I know that there are a lot of, not a ton, but some ranching operations that utilize it too for large cattle that die and they need to process that. They'll dig like a huge trench and cover it up with a little dirt and hope that it kind of composts over time. And people that have the yard space, or I know some people that just bury their food in their garden. Um, I don't think that's a terrible method, especially if you do it in the fall. But the problem is that it's going to tie up a lot of the microbes, bacteria, fungi that are going to go to work processing that material that's in there, that raw material, instead of um, focusing on your garden plants and trying to get them the nutrients they need. So they're kind of distracted for a while, if that makes sense. I guess what we have, I mean, we have sort of just that big, heavy wooden lid mm -hmm. on like a four by four pit. Totally, but, cool. Because we have so much nitrogen stuff, it's stank like heck put away from the house. Yeah, it's, it's, but, yeah. Did, did you notice if it broke down over time and if it did, what it turned into? Sludge. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the shade. It's leachate, it's actually pretty toxic. Yes, you don't want to put that on your garden. Just, but you know, I'm not saying that. No offense, you know. Yeah, I've got, I have myself put a ton of 
food waste in a five gallon bucket and forgot about it for a really long time and come back to it and something similar, so. <laughs> it breaks down real quick. Yeah, it does. Fly attractant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you consider a spent grain for just brewing to be like carbon or nitrogen? Mm -hmm. Um, actually, it's really high nitrogen. Yeah. So that's actually a good point. Something that looks kind of brown. Um, that's in fact nitrogenous. Thank you for bringing that up. Actually. Yeah. Thank you.